The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Coming up on today's verdict, we have all heard the term medical malpractice, but when does a mistake actually become actionable? We look at the myths surrounding malpractice lawsuits so you can determine if you or someone you know has a potential claim. Also, we check back in with the community of East Harlem to see how they have been faring in the wake of last month's tragedy. As you can see, we have much to discuss, so stay right here. Today's verdict starts right now. Hello and welcome to today's verdict, the show that gives you your legal rights and options. I'm your host and trial attorney for the next 30 minutes, David Lesh. We're getting right to the heart of tonight's show, medical malpractice, and here in studio to talk to us about the truths and myths surrounding malpractice action is Stephen Erickson of Pegalis and Erickson. Counselor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here, David. It's right. a pleasure to see you again. Myths. Let's talk about some myths. One myth that I want to get right to is are there too many frivolous malpractice lawsuits? There are no, virtually no frivolous malpractice lawsuits. In order to prosecute a claim for a patient who's been injured as a result of medical malpractice, an attorney has to spend tens of thousands of dollars to obtain the records, to obtain an expert review by a physician to determine whether or not there's validity to the case, to have that witness testify, to have that doctor testify in a courtroom. Tens of thousands of dollars are necessary in order to pursue that claim on behalf of the injured party. No attorney is going to do that on a frivolous case. What would it, what would it cost to, to say just to even start an action? with? Because you really would want the records first before you even decide you want to take the case. You know, the cost, and, and let me just say, the cost to the patient is essentially zero. The attorneys will pay for obtaining the records. The attorneys will pay for obtaining uh, a physician to review the records to see whether or not there is a valid claim there. So let me just put that up front, that it's not a cost to the patient. That cost is borne by the attorney, and then it'll be worked out at the end of the case. But the cost of obtaining the records can be thousands of dollars just to obtain the hospital record, and then you have to have a physician review that to see if there's merit to a claim. That costs another several thousand dollars, and it's not something someone's going to do frivolously. Well, some would say, well, you know, that the payout is so, can be so great that the attorneys would be willing to take this risk and spend that kind of money, but that's not necessarily that, true that, at all. That doesn't happen. Uh, you know, is there an exception to the rule? Of course there's an exception, but the vast majority of cases that are pursued are, in fact, based on valid malpractice claims where some, some doctor, some hospital did something wrong and the patient suffered a serious injury as a result. I want to talk about a, a, another, let's say, myth, and that's um, issues of doctors who are, who are overspending to protect themselves from potential malpractice claims. Truth or myth? A an absolute myth. Doctors who order additional tests, first off, the test is going to benefit the patient. Whether that additional test is an X-ray, an MRI, a CAT scan, or some laboratory test, it's going to benefit the patient because the patient will know one way or another, does the patient have this problem? Does the patient not have this problem? And if the tests are too outlandish, the insurance company is not going to pay for it. So there's no additional cost. The insurance companies have control over that, so they're not paying for these additional tests, and it just doesn't happen. It's just a win-win, and, and, and certainly the patients would, would even want an additional test if, just to make sure. I mean, that might be one of the reasons they even bring a malpractice claim, because they're not even sure what exactly went on. Am I That's correct? That's exactly true. There are, you know, you have a problem with your heart, and you're having significant heart problems. You want as many tests as the doctors have to find out what's causing these problems to prevent your death. All right. Another myth. Let's talk about this. This is interesting. Doctors are fleeing, right? They're leaving. 
in droves. Well, they're certainly not leaving New York. I can tell you that much. There are more doctors in New York now than there were 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, brilliant college students are trying to get into med schools. They cannot get into medical schools. There are more doctors now in New York than there ever have been. Doctors are not fleeing New York. They're certainly not fleeing New York City. All right, this is a big one, and this is something uh, it's tough to argue with. Premiums. The, the amount of money that the doctors are paying for their malpractice insurance. I, listen, insurance premiums always are going up. I, it's hard to argue. I can't imagine any field where the insurance premiums necessarily go down. But do they have a valid argument here? Keep the malpractice actions away from us. Our premiums go down. I save money and I can give, I can practice medicine with a clear head. David, as you know, there are some states, California, other states, where they do have caps on, on claims what patients can, re can recover from medical malpractice. In those states where there are caps, the premiums are virtually the same. And yes, insurance premiums always go up. Your car premiums go up, homeowners premiums go up, every insurance you pay for goes up. You know, just, just so we can educate the public, because I don't think the public really understands how an insurance company makes money. Sure, very, very briefly. Insurance companies invest their premiums in the stock market and various other investments. And every time there is a downturn in the stock market, the insurance companies lose money. It has nothing to do with medical malpractice claims, nothing to do with medical malpractice payouts. It's simply the effect of Wall Street and the stock market on the insurance companies' So it's not how profits. much they're necessarily paying out. It's what they're necessarily not making on their own investment. The it's really vast majority about. that the insurance companies gain is increases in their investments, not payouts on the malpractice oh, claims. I think you would touch on this earlier. In those states where they have caps, in terms of how much you can recover for a particular injury, a malpractice claim. Are the insurance premiums lower compared to the there United States? There is no statistical difference in those states as compared to New York. When you put everything equal on the table, you know, premiums in certain states are going to be less than New York. Of course, the living is less in, in certain states other than New York. But if you compare equality, such as California and New York, the premiums are virtually the same throughout the specialties. Let's talk about some of the more heinous uh, malpractice uh, cases that have been reported. Um, legs that are taken off by accident. Um, I, I read where recently were in Oregon that was cancerous. They, they mixed up two patients. They took the or with similar names. They took the 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 organ that was not cancerous out of somebody, and the one that was cancerous, they let him walk around the city, never notifying him that, by the way, you were the one that we were supposed to remove the organ, the, not the person that we took it out. These things happen, or is this just reported? This does happen, and, and I can tell you two cases that we had. One, a woman with, uh, who had gone to, for an evaluation for breast cancer, the laboratory report came back and said she had aggressive breast cancer. She underwent a mastectomy. Both breasts were removed. Six months later, she was notified it was the wrong patient. They had sent the doctor the results on the wrong patient. She did not have cancer. Both breasts were removed for no reason other than egregious malpractice on behalf of the defendants. Another case, which was a terrible case, a woman had gone in for surgery on her brain. The doctor actually had the wrong MRI on the film and started operating on the wrong side of the patient's brain. And obviously the patient suffered significant problems as a result of that. So these things happen. They're happening continuously. The doctors, I will give credit to the doctors in the hospitals, they're trying now to prevent some of these claims from happening. How? Because I know we talked off camera a little bit about these timeouts. What exactly are, you, are, they, are we talking about here? Most hospitals and doctors who are uh, practicing careful medicine, when they're going in for surgery, before the surgeon picks up the scalpel, they call a timeout. And everyone who's there, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the nurses, they all discuss which patient it is, what the patient is there for, what procedure they're going to do, what part of the body they're going to operate on. And if there's any disagreement, they have to stop. Even though the patient's already anesthetized, they stop until they figure out what is going on. And that prevents a tremendous number of problems, just a simple procedure like that. And I understand, by the way, that there are, there are markings that are supposed to be made by the doctors on the body part that's supposed to be operated on. Does this happen? Is it supposed to happen? It happens, and it's, it's a great 
a piece of practice to follow where the patient, before the patient receives any anesthesia, the patient marks on his or her own body the area that's going to be operated on while the patient is clear and lucid and knows what's going on. This way, when the patient gets to the operating room and they're anesthetized, the doctor can see there's a big arrow. This right, knee, this, is what you this knee, this is what we want to work on. Uh, fascinating for me is this bedside manner uh, and the, um, the inclination of a patient not to bring an action against the doctor if they seem to be getting at least some nice treatment from a doctor. Does that seem to be true, not true? It, it is true. And, uh, you know, if a patient feels that a doctor was actually looking out for their best interests and not simply ordering tests and the patient is not just another piece in the assembly line, the patient begins to identify with that doctor and feels very strong, warm feelings to the, for that doctor. And the patient is very reluctant to bring a claim against that doctor, even if that doctor did it something It should be wrong. mandatory training, this bedside. You, but I don't know how you can you would think so. train that. Um, all right, some tips. Somebody's watching the show right now. They think they have a potential medical malpractice issue. What would you tell them? The first thing they should do is contact an attorney. I'll say the first thing they should do is contact me. Okay? Absolutely. <laughs> but they should contact an attorney because an attorney will be able to help them obtain the records. An attorney will have a physician that they will be able to find and contact to review those records because the patients are generally don't know where to start. Sure. They know something went wrong. They feel there was a problem, but they don't know where to begin. Contact an attorney. By the way, there are time limits here. People don't understand. It's, certainly, if you have city hospitals involved, I mean, there, am I, am I there correct? are significant time limits. You have to file a notice of claim, as you well know, within a certain amount of time, depending on whether you're dealing with an infant or an older person. And the time limits can be very short, as short as 90 days. Um, so the patients really should, or the family should contact an attorney, Steve Erickson, <laughs> as fast as they can. And taking a, and take, it's okay, no, you shouldn't. And now, taking a step back now, before the malpractice even occurs, um, and we talked about a little about the timeout, you're a patient, you want to protect yourself. Um, no one's, do you bring somebody with you to maybe talk to the doctor for you? I mean, what would you, let's say it was a family member, what advice would you say, look, what's this before you go in for this operation? I would always have a family member there so that not only the patient, but the family member can explain to the doctor what they want done. Sometimes these patients are elderly, they may be a little forgetful, and not 100% not sure what is going on. If you have a family member who's there and say, no, doctor, what we're really here for is this, and that family member can do wonders for making sure that their loved one receives the appropriate care. Okay, and final thoughts in terms of malpractice actions. They're here to stay in New York, am I correct? We're not getting any caps. Um, what, what's your, your, your thoughts on that? Well, I know that the uh, tort reform industry is always going full steam ahead. Which, by the way, we gave equal time on this program, just so you know. Well, okay. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and, and certainly, you know, wearing the hat that you're wearing, um, you know, it just it looks like New York is, is cap free for a while. Until doctors and hospitals get to the point where they no longer commit malpractice, where they're not making mistakes and patients aren't being injured, we should always have medical malpractice and well, claims on behalf Stephen, of patients. Great advice. I want to thank you. You come back on again. To Anytime. What's, what's it was great. All right. Well, we have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll catch up with the local businesses of East Harlem one month after the tragic explosion. Stay with us. And Tommy can dance. So we're going to put some ants in their pants. Aww. Kids will spend 22 minutes watching us, the super duper party troopers, sing about ants in their pants. Isn't that funny? Ants in their pants, they got ants in their pants. They got ants in their pants. They got ants in their pants. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I made it.
Welcome back to today's verdict. I'm David Lesh. Remember to stay in touch with us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can always see past episodes on bronxnet.org. We're here on set with Clark Pena of East Harlem We Stand and Robert Gross, a community lawyer helping local businesses. I want to welcome both of you to the show. Clark, Thank you for having us, David. I want to get right back into, into East Harlem. How are we doing there? We are coming back, slowly okay. but surely. Uh, uh, the only problem is that a lot of the uh, folks uh, are not back to full recovery as far as the businesses are concerned, and we may lose uh, some of the uh, local businesses. And is that because they're not getting funding from, from the government to keep them going? Or what, are, how, what are we doing to try and help them right now? It has been really slow uh, right. for them to get the uh, help that's needed. I'll give you a perfect example. There's one business that is uh, open, but is uh, e EBT machines are down because the uh, the uh, local wiring is still down. So uh, he can't uh, take EBT cards and he tank cre can't take credit cards. So he cannot uh, work to full capacity. So it's not just the, the 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 residents themselves that have been displaced. It's the commercial property. It's just it, it's just one thing after another. Yes. All right, Mr. Gross. Let's talk about a little bit about uh, what you do. Tell me a little bit how you're helping the community in East Harlem, if you could. Sure. I have a law practice basically catering to uh, the community. Uh, this uh, community in East Harlem, is uh, they have certain needs and uh, basically, uh, like others, uh, they have a parasitic approach that come. I actually live and work in the community and uh, I try to assist them. And what type of assistance do, they, do, they, do they need? What, tell me what's, what have they been asking for? What do they really need right now? Recently, from they, a legal standpoint, right. Right. recently they need a, uh, a voice, and thanks to uh, Mr. Pena, he introduced me to the businesses of uh, in East Harlem, specifically the explosion of a few months ago. And uh, basically, the people believe that uh, if this explosion happened south of 96th Street, we'd have a very different response. And uh, I've been able to. And why? Them. Why is that? Is it, does East Harlem or Harlem just feel that they're not getting the the attention that? that the Upper East Side, let's say, would get, or maybe be a little more specific. Well, I think that. we can all agree, if this happened on the Upper East Side, I think we can uh, say that the uh, response would be dramatically different. Well, in East Harlem now, you have, you have displacement from, from homes. Um, obviously, you know, they're, they're looking for another place to live. Is there any way, are you helping them at all, maybe try and find other residents, leases? What's going on in terms of moving people in different places. Well, I've been uh, working specifically with the, uh, with the business owners and okay. those particular uh, folks who have been injured uh, as a result of the uh, explosion. And, and, and what kind of things are they looking for? Are they looking for representation for more of an emotional injury, for a, um, a personal issue, a pers personal injury, a little both? Tell me what it exactly is that you've come across in terms of the suffering. I think uh, the uh, post-traumatic stress goes hand in hand with some of the personal injuries. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, here we've all suffered in Manhattan in 2000, uh, in 2001 uh, with the uh, with 9/11. But uh, just the explosion, the first thing everyone thought of is the uh, possible terrorist attack. And whether you were actually uh, uh, injured inside one of the buildings or even directly outside, it brings back very harsh memories. Even those, uh, you know, a few miles north of the explosion site back right. then. I mean, Clark. I mean, I think I was even telling you off camera that I've, I've heard of instances where. People have been on a bus blocks away and have been affected by this particular um, incident. Have you heard of situations yeah. like that? Absolutely. Well? There, there's, uh, you know, and, and you will know that when things like this happen, you have the walking wounded, uh, people that don't go to the hospital but are going through some serious psychological issues. Uh, and I've um, heard it over and over again. Are you helping uh, them with any type of counseling? Are you getting them for any kind of treatment? We have referred uh, people that come to us. Obviously, uh, in East Harlem, we stand. We have been given clothing and, and, and items uh, of, of that type. But the emotional, uh, uh, the emotional uh, scars, we have been referring them to uh, Mount Sinai, which right. is a local hospital, and, and well, hopefully they can get some help there. You've also been you know, raising money through some fundraising, am I correct? Tell us some of the th other things you've been doing. Well, uh, specifically the city. Okay. Uh, the city is, um, has a fund through the mayor's office uh, and also through uh, uh, Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito's office, and she covers that district, uh, which is the 8th Councilmanic District. So they've been doing uh, yeah. the fundraising on their, on their own, and uh, from what I understand, it's gone very well. Okay, Robert, let's talk a little bit about some of the claims. Uh, the people that you've been dealing with that's been coming in the office. Do you find that there have been lawsuits that have been filed uh, as a result of the explosion, or are people still a little bit hesitant to, to start bringing suit? No, people uh, are basically looking for answers. There are a lot of people who think they have insurance and perhaps don't have insurance. There are people that have insurance and do not have the experience of dealing with insurance companies. 
And uh, then there's uh, landlord-tenant issues, you know, who actually is supposed to have the insurance? And, uh, you know, how do you deal with insurance companies and deductibles? Or how much is my, uh, how much are my employees or uh, how much have I been making and showing bank statements to my insurance? Sometimes they make it very difficult for these business owners. Well, what could you do for them that might possibly help get to the bottom of it? Do you write letters to a, to a landlord? Do you, any subpoena? Like, how do you, how do you find out these information? Even there's even, if there is is even insurance on a building? Well, that's a great question, and uh, we offer a legal clinic in my office that we uh, have a couple of nights a week. Uh, I'm sorry, a couple of nights a month, I should say. But uh, yeah, I mean, the first step is obviously to uh, you know keep uh, good records of yourself. Uh, everyone should have good insurance records, right? But if right. you do not, well, certainly if you're in a house in, in a building that, that unfortunately you know explodes, right. Where are all your documents? You know, that's one issue. But you're right, there are businesses around the area that are being affected that um, didn't have documents that were blown up. So they should have good, good record keeping, am I correct? They should, right? And sometimes the owner of the business is not on site. So you have a manager, which uh, I've, I don't know if Clark got uh, the same uh, experience, but uh, there are times that people are on site trying to take care of the day-to-day -day operations and are left basically in the dark. Why is that, Clark? Um, no one ever expected for this to ever happen. Uh, this is uh, uh, definitely something that uh, no one really prepared for. Uh, you know, so I, I think moving forward, after we find out what, uh, who's responsible here, we have to, uh, instead of being reactive, let's be a little bit more proactive. Let's prepare for things like this in the future. All right, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the infrastructure. I mean, this is really what a lot of people want to talk about here because we do not want this happening again, no. right? Um, what, is th what is the talk in the community? Should the city be ripping up the sidewalks to find out what's going on with the pipes? Should Con Ed be doing something? What have you heard? Well, basically what I've heard is, uh, you know, we don't want this to happen again, so let's uh, do what, whatever is necessary. Uh, people reaching out to their local elected officials, uh, you know, Congressman Charlie Rango and all the others, uh, to um, hold those responsible uh, to task. Let's see what went wrong. And let's uh, stop this from ever happening again. All right, well, guys, stay right here. We have to take Sorry. a quick break. we got more today's verdict coming up after this. Don't look at me. Your hair's a bit frizzy today. Aww. You should pick that up. <laughs> oh, you're such a dork. Loser. Here, let me help you with that. Oops. <laughs> Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look. Your crush is looking at you. Poor <laughs> you. They want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. because no one Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit StopBullying.gov. All right, welcome back to today's verdict. We're back on set with Clark Pena and Robert Gross talking about East Harlem and local businesses affected by the explosion last month. Robert, um... Khaled, city, who's responsible for this? Landlords, please shed, shed, shed some light on the issue here. Right now, I believe there's an ongoing investigation. Okay. That's the easiest uh, answer to give. However, uh, when people are injured, the first thing uh, attorneys usually uh, uh, guide people to are the deep pockets. Uh, at this point, it could be uh, Con Ed. I think they've uh, also uh, initially started handing out checks. And uh, these checks uh, allegedly have no strings attached. Uh, these checks I are should hope they should have no strings right. attached. Right, attached. and that was, a, that was an issue, I guess, for some of the local business owners. They thought by perhaps uh, accepting these checks, it was more like a waiver of any future suits. Right. But uh, at, at this point right now, I think uh, you know, the city, Con Ed, there might be a few other uh, folks that are involved. Clark, the, the, the different politicians that you've been working with here, um, what are they doing to make sure this does not happen again? Are they doing anything? Well, they are. Uh, bringing it, uh, they're keeping it, it uh, you know, on the cameras, which is very okay, important. That's yes. important. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard Charlie Rangel. He's been speaking about the infrastructure, which is very important at the federal level. Right. Uh, we have uh, count, uh, Councilwoman Melissa Marquez-Benito, who is our speaker. She's also uh, uh, keeping it in the, uh, in, in, in the uh, in, on camera so people can understand that uh, this uh, situation has yet not gone away. Is there a sense in the community that people are forgetting about them again? Is it, a, is Absolutely. it a feeling like the cameras leaving? There are no cameras left. There are no cameras, uh, left. There are no cameras left, and uh, people are still suffering. Uh, so uh, thanks to programs like this, we're able to uh, get the message out. All right, Robert, you're watching the show, right? And you're not too sure if you have a claim. You were around the area. You got some 
some emotional issues now. You, you don't feel good. Um, you, you've been maybe getting some 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 works work at a you know looking at a you know maybe going to a clinic. What advice would you give to somebody who's watching and thinks they may have a potential claim as a result of what happened in East in East Harlem? Well, uh, our office actually offers uh, a couple of times a month, like I said before, some type of legal clinic. The first thing that I would say to this uh, potential claimant is to get a medical checkup. And obviously there's some issues of insurance issues or things of this nature, but clearly you want to document uh, your any illnesses that you may have. And you want to think back, what were you doing? What were you doing that day? And things of that nature. Should they write these things out just so they have a, a little diary of knowing exactly what was going on that day so their memory doesn't uh, fade? I think that's a great idea. All right. And uh, people definitely do not do that. And over time, uh, as you just said, memories may fade. Over time, people lose sight of actually what they were doing. And, uh, you know, this may affect any. And just so the viewers understand, by the way, when we're talking about the city of New York here, again, we have a time limit here to bring these actions against them. Am I right? How that's, long is that? That's right. It's a 90 day window, a notice of claim, it's called. Okay. And uh, it's, it's, you know, there are some, some specific uh, time periods where you can get away with filing late, but most of the times, you know, as you know, that. Uh, Basically, better, you know. better make sure you yeah. stay within that time. All right, that's Clark. why you have to contact an attorney. Exactly. All right, Clark, before uh, we let you guys go, sure. some final thoughts for the community. What would you give some advice to people who are watching today? And they have been affected by this. If you're not feeling well, uh, get to the hospital, get yourself checked out. Uh, if you uh, feel like many people do, that they're having, uh, 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 they're afraid to go back into their stores or back into their apartments, uh, seek uh, psychological help. Don't be, don't, don't be ashamed. Don't feel afraid. That's good advice. And I, I hope you both gentlemen will come back on and let us know how East Harlem is progressing in the coming months. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, that's all for tonight. It's time to deliberate. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining and, of course, you for watching. Remember, if there is a legal issue or topic you'd like to see on the show, email me at davidlesh at bronxnet.org. And until we see you again, always remember, know your rights, know your issues, reach a verdict. We'll see you next time. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of children. In